If you've watched pretty much anything on this channel, you'll know that I hate car-dependent suburbia. The oversized roads, the car traffic, parking lots that are bigger than the shops they service, being unable to even buy food without getting in a car, constantly needing to pass through depressing landscapes where nobody wants to be just in order to get anywhere, financially insolvent places that need subsidies to stay afloat, asphalt as far as the eye can see. This awful view from my cousin's balcony that I keep showing in almost every video because, I mean, just look at this. Everything about this is terrible. Why do we keep building places like this? More importantly, why is it impossible to build almost anything other than places like this anymore? Incidentally, when selling this apartment, the real estate agent walked onto the balcony and introduced this as the million dollar view. My cousin literally broke out laughing. He only bought this apartment so that he could be close to his cannabis testing facility. But time and time again, people misunderstand the issue. I like the suburbs, they'll claim. I want a backyard, they'll say. Not everyone can live in cities. This completely and utterly misses the point. There is not a problem with suburbs. Suburbs have existed almost as long as cities have existed, and there is nothing inherently wrong with them. The problem is car-dependent suburbs, and that's what I mean when I talk about suburbia. Of course, the confusion is understandable, because for about the last 60 years or so, car-dependent suburbs have been the only suburbs that were legal to build in most places in the United States, Canada, and some other countries like Australia. Which means there are entire generations, literally hundreds of millions of people, who have no concept of a suburb except that of a car-dependent suburb. Talk to a typical American, and they'll probably tell you you can only live in one of two places. A busy city, or a car-dependent suburb. Because almost nothing has been built in between those two extremes for as long as they've been alive. But it doesn't have to be this way. It is possible to build suburbs that don't suck. Now personally, I love cities. But that's not for everyone. They might want to live somewhere quieter. They might want a house with a yard. Or maybe they just want cheaper housing. Unlike most Not Just Bikes videos, I'm not going to focus too much on the Netherlands here, even though there are some great suburbs here. Because the truth is, while the US and Canada were the ones that invented and perfected depressing car-dependent suburbia, it didn't used to be this way. Before the Second World War, it was easy to find suburbs that don't suck. Before car dependency, suburbs were walkable. A walkable suburb may have been built around a train station or other public transit. Alan Fisher, aka the Armchair Urbanist, made a great video about Pittman, a nice pre-war railroad suburb in New Jersey. A nice suburb should surround every suburban rail station, instead of a sea of asphalt and parking like this one. In this video, however, I want to specifically talk about a development pattern that was very common throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the streetcar suburb. As the name suggests, streetcar suburbs are suburbs built around streetcar lines. These were designed as self-contained places, mixed-use neighborhoods with residential, commercial, and offices in the same area. And although they are suburbs, where you can drive if you want to, they also have just about everything you could need within walking distance. Streetcar suburbs are found all over the US and Canada, though in most cases the streetcar tracks were torn up long ago. Toronto, Canada is one of the very few exceptions. When we lived in Toronto, we lived in Riverdale, which is a fantastic streetcar suburb on the east side of town. It's interesting to compare streetcar suburbs like this one with modern car-dependent suburbia because it provides an insight into where we've gone wrong with suburban design. Riverdale is well connected by several streetcar lines, one of which was converted into a subway in the 1960s. Unfortunately, when the subway was completed, the streetcar line was removed and the street was turned into a strode. Thankfully, over 50 years later, the strode is slowly being turned back into a street. These bicycle lanes were installed last year, for example. Riverdale is a neighborhood full of beautiful streets with a mix of detached and semi-detached houses, as well as apartments and townhomes, and even a housing co-op. This provided a variety of housing options and a variety of housing prices. More on that later. 
The neighborhood is centered around a park that has become a regular meeting space for families. There's a big park on the west side of the neighborhood too, and there are several other small parkettes sprinkled throughout the neighborhood. The streets are narrow and feel comfortable to walk along. There are always people out walking, and children can walk to their friend's house or a park on their own too. Incidentally, this walkability for kids means this is also one of the best neighborhoods for Halloween trick-or-treating. Kids can hit up a lot of doors in a short distance. I made a Patreon bonus video about how Halloween is better in walkable places. The residents also close off a street to car traffic for several days to put on a Halloween show each year. In general, this kind of neighborhood encourages a strong sense of community. Unlike modern suburbia with massive schools servicing a wide area, Riverdale has several schools, meaning that all children are within easy walking distance and most kids in the neighborhood walk to school. There are several commercial streets along the periphery, so it's easy to do day-to-day -day shopping without having to sit in traffic on your way to a big box store or shopping mall. What's very unique, though, is that there aren't just shops along the commercial street, but also some commercial buildings within the neighborhood. This is never found in modern suburbs, and I talk about this in my Livable Neighborhoods video. These local shops are a way to buy something quick without having to go out to the main street, and the cafes act as a third place for residents, a place to meet outside of home or work. There are multiple grocery stores as well, which can be accessed not just by driving, but also by walking, cycling, or public transit. This has interesting implications for land use. Take for example this large grocery store chain. It has a parking lot for cars, but because you don't need a car to get there, it doesn't have to be that big. Here's the size of the store, and here's the size of the parking lot. Here's a grocery store in car-dependent suburbia. And here's the size of the parking lot, significantly larger than the store itself, which is typical for car-dependent places. And of course, some of the grocery stores in Riverdale only have street parking, and there are a variety of butchers, bakers, vegetable stores, and other places to buy food as well. Parking for residents is often on street, but many streets have laneways behind the houses, providing access to off-street parking. These laneways keep the garages in the back of the house and out of sight, making the neighborhood look better, but they also minimize the places where cars cross the sidewalk, making it safer to walk. And if you don't have a car, you can use the space in the laneway for something more useful. The population density of Riverdale is quite high, with over 7,000 people per square kilometer almost twice as high as the rest of the city, and over six times that of the suburban hellscape where my cousin's apartment was located. Interestingly, it's also not that different from where we currently live in Amsterdam Zoud, which looks significantly denser. But despite the high population density, it doesn't feel like a dense urban environment because of the parks and tree-lined streets. In short, Riverdale is a beautiful suburb to live in and a great place to raise a family. Today, there's a huge demand for places like Riverdale. People want to live in suburbs like this, even if they don't know what walkability means and have never heard the term streetcar suburb. Because when you come from a car-dependent suburban wasteland to a place like Riverdale, you feel the difference. This is a place designed to a human scale. It has lots of houses with backyards, parks, and trees everywhere, but it also has people instead of fast-moving cars. And housing prices reflect this desire. The cost of housing in Riverdale has consistently outpaced the rest of the city for about the past 15 years. Unfortunately, prices have gone up so much in Riverdale that if we move back to Toronto today, we couldn't afford to live there anymore. The average price of a home in Riverdale has gone from about $170,000 in 1996 to $1.2 million in 2021. Which means that if we moved to Toronto, and didn't want to live in an apartment, we'd be forced to live in a desolate, car-dependent suburb. We'd have no other choice. But despite the very high demand for walkable neighborhoods, you couldn't build another Riverdale today, and that scarcity is part of what's driving up prices. We've effectively legislated walkability out of existence. Specifically, here are some of the reasons why you can't build this kind of suburb anymore in the US or Canada. This quaint, comfortable street is about six meters wide. It's a two-lane road with street parking. 
This causes drivers to slow down, which makes the street less hostile to pedestrians and cyclists. It's part of the reason why this street is so nice. It also means the tree canopy can cover the street. But these lane widths do not meet modern traffic engineering standards. So in suburbia, this road would have to be somewhere between 10 to 15 meters wide depending on local requirements. Everybody's going to drive, so we're going to need to have enough room for all those cars, right? Here's what a 15 meter wide suburban street looks like. The streets of Riverdale are aligned on a fine grid, with alternating one-way streets to discourage through traffic while still allowing people to walk the most direct route. Sometimes cyclists get to take the shortest route if they're given a contraflow lane like this. Of course, cyclists should be able to go in both directions on all residential one-way streets because bicycles are not cars, but I digress. Our new suburb has winding streets and cul-de-sacs with large distances between blocks, meaning that everyone, even people walking, need to take the long route. So it always makes more sense to drive. And of course, the zoning in Riverdale would never meet modern standards. The hallmark of car-dependent suburbia is that residential neighborhoods are completely separated from commercial uses, meaning a car is required for every trip. The yellow parts on this map show where you can only build houses, you won't find a quaint cafe in the middle of a suburban neighborhood anymore. Even where the boundaries between these residential and commercial spaces meet, they're usually separated by giant strodes that are uncomfortable or dangerous places to be outside of a car. So even if the distances are theoretically close enough to walk, nobody will actually do it. In many suburbs, even schools are not allowed within the neighborhood because of traffic concerns. It's automatically assumed that all students will need to be driven, so schools are consolidated into one large school, which is located along a major arterial road that can handle all the expected traffic. Roads that are too dangerous for children to walk along, which requires them to be driven to school. Talk about a self-fulfilling prophecy. There's evidence suggesting that driving your child to school is one of the worst things you can do for their development and independence, but I'll talk about that in more detail in a future video. The houses in Riverdale are mixed, with detached homes coexisting with many other types. This would not be permitted in a typical modern suburb as they are zoned exclusively for single-family homes. I talked about this before in my Missing Middle video. Toronto now even has a regulation stating that a building can only have one front door. This was upheld in a recent debate by City Council because it would impact the character or aesthetic of neighborhoods. And as you can clearly see, this house in Riverdale is totally ruining the character and aesthetic of the neighborhood by having two front doors. Disgraceful, really. Next, the lot sizes here are too small. In Riverdale, you'll even find some lot sizes under 1,500 square feet, but modern suburbia will enforce a minimum lot size of anywhere from 7,000 to over 80,000 square feet. Even if you want to live in a tiny home which you're also not allowed to do because there are minimum building sizes as well. And there are also regulations preventing you from building a lot that's too narrow. This significantly affects the density of the neighborhood and makes distances even more difficult to walk, fueling more car dependence. These strict requirements also mean that most suburban houses are built the same and at a very similar price point too. I mean, we can't have people of marginally different socioeconomic status living near each other because otherwise... So anyway, these houses are too close to the street too, and wouldn't meet setback requirements. In suburbia, houses need to be set back from the road by anywhere from 10 to 20 meters or more because some 1950s planner decided that having a big front yard is the only proper way to live so everybody needs to conform to that ideal. Incidentally, the pressure on developers to build as many houses as possible, combined with a strict setback requirement, is why you'll sometimes see new suburban houses with a backyard that's smaller than the front yard. Ugh, I hate mowing the lawn. I am going to make a whole video someday about how much I hate front lawns. Finally, these homes in Riverdale also don't meet minimum parking requirements. A typical car-dependent suburb requires at least two off-street parking spaces per house, because there's an automatic assumption that every home needs to own multiple cars, so of course, it's enshrined by law. And this is nowhere near a comprehensive list. There are many other Byzantine requirements embedded in suburban zoning codes that enforce a very specific style of development. When you look at suburbia, there's an overwhelming sameness to it. And that sameness stretches across the entire continent, with very few exceptions. 
You might think that this comes from the laziness of real estate developers, or market forces converging on one popular design, but a lot of this really comes out of the regulations in place that make it impossible to build anything other than places that look exactly like this. Even if you prefer car-dependent suburbia, you need to justify why it should be illegal to build anything other than car-dependent suburbia, because clearly there are lots of people who would gladly live in another Riverdale if it were possible to build it. So what would a modern walkable suburb look like? Well, that's what I'll explore in future videos in this series. Here in the Netherlands, we don't have the same car-centric policies that lead to American-style suburbia. In fact, over the past few decades, Dutch regulations have done exactly the opposite. They make it extremely difficult to build car-dependent places. Here, you'll find suburbs where, even if you commute by car, you can still do all of your other trips without one. Suburbs that can financially sustain themselves. Suburbs that are quiet and peaceful, but without the soul-crushing traffic. But I'll talk about those in future videos, about suburbs that don't suck. I'd like to thank my supporters on Patreon, who pay me to read through hundreds of pages of suburban zoning codes. If you'd like to support the channel and get access to bonus videos, visit patreon.com slash notjustbikes.